So we're up to lesson plan number 92. We're in the final week of uh, Jesus' life. And uh, everybody seems to be getting together to ask him questions. But they're not questions because they want to know the answers. They're asking questions to try and entrap Jesus to get him into a position so that they can destroy him. And destroy the movement that goes with him. Things we've covered recently on this, in, during this week, you, we know that he arrived in Bethany on Friday, and then on Saturday he had dinner with Simon and Lazarus, Martha and Mary, and he was anointed by Mary. On Sunday he made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on the donkey as was foretold in the Old Testament. And on Monday, remember he cursed the fig tree in front of the disciples and we, in order to teach them about their need for being repentant when they say prayers. And he also cleansed the temple. This is the second time he cleansed the temple, getting rid of all the money changers and merchandisers. Then on Tuesday, he returned to the temple and he began teaching there. And this probably started what was the most grueling part of his ministry were, were those few days. You know, that Tuesday was a day of teaching and a day of questions and a day of conflict and a day of rejection. <coughs> So we've already started this day and have been studying in the last couple of lessons about Jesus being in the temple and the Sanhedrin questioning his authority. And then Jesus taught the first, the first three parables we covered to show them how they had abused their authority. It was this abuse of their authority that has led to a division between themselves and God and begins to turn the Israelites away from righteousness. So can you imagine being surrounded by people who do not like, simply do not like you, but continue to come after you to bring you down? Can you imagine having to put up with that day in and day out? It's what's happening to Jesus. It's what happens to God every day. People work actively to bring God down and to bring his followers down. We know that they will never bring God down, but they can bring his followers down by the evil that they do, by the, by the abnormal things they tend to try and make normal and... and uh, and turn it around on the Christians to say, well, you, there's something wrong with you that you don't accept this evil as being normal. But can you imagine being God and having to go through every day knowing that this is going on to your children, that that the people that you have selected to be your chosen ones have turned against you and continually fight those battles. And Jesus' teachings have, been, have exposed the Jewish hierarchy and made them more determined than ever to destroy him at this time. They actually co cooperated together. People that... All these little groups normally didn't even get along. But they were so threatened by Jesus, they actually cooperated in their attempts to try to get rid of him. They sent their smartest people to try and entrap him. Their little spies, you know. Kind of reminds you of that old cartoon, Spy versus Spy, you know. <laughs> They're constantly blowing each other up and stuff, and... Never did succeed. Well, that's kind of how they were. 
But that should tell you a lot about how much they hated Jesus in that they would work together even though they couldn't get along in the normal sense. So who were these people? You know, once in a while it helps to go back and, and take a look at just who, who were these people that were out after Christ. We, we, hear, we hear them talk about different factions as we go through reading the Bible. So I just thought I'd throw in here, this is who they were. The scribes. The scribes, these were, these were lawyers whose primary job was to copy the scripture. Their focus became the details or the letters of the law, and they, they transitioned from mere copyists to teachers of the scriptures over, over a period of time within the uh, Jewish religion. The next were the Sanhedrin. We've heard them mentioned a lot. That's a group of judges. It was made up of a council of 70 Jewish men who were directly under the high priest. They acted it like our Supreme Court in legal and religious trials. And some believe that the group began under the rule of King Jehoshaphat around 800 B.C. That's when the Sanhedrin was developed. So they're the judges. Okay? And so if somebody had a religious complaint or a legal complaint against you, they could draw, drag you before the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees. This group evolved out of a group of Jewish separatists during the Maccabean Revolt. They sought to protect the right worship of God. And Jesus eventually criticized them for for adherence to the traditions of their father rather than seeking the words of God. In other words, this is who he was talking about when he said you can't replace the words of God with the traditions of men. So while they may have started out with a right heart, they weren't any longer pursuing a right heart. They, they were entrenching the Jewish religion on manly, manly traditions more than godly words. The Sadducees. This group was functionally like the Pharisees as far as being a group with religious, religious intent. The primary ways they differed from the Pharisees is that the Sadducees rejected all scriptures besides the Torah. That means... Genesis through Deuteronomy. They thought that was all the scriptures there were. Okay. That's all they believed in following. And they rejected the belief in a future generation or general resurrection of the body. In other words, heaven. When they thought about death, it was just you're alive or you're dead. Okay, just like Rover, you're dead all over, as far as they were concerned. There was no heaven, there were no angels, no spiritual side of God. Okay? However, the two groups hated one another, except when they found a con common enemy, like Jesus. And then we have the Herodians. These are members of a Jewish sect associated with the Pharisees in opposition to Jesus. That doesn't mean they were Pharisees. It means they got along as long as they could help them get rid of Jesus. They were a political group okay, that were supporters of Herod the Great. So you can see he had, he had his hands full. And if, if we look at Matthew 22, verses 15 through 16, it says, then the, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, right? This is what they were all about. How can we get him to say something that we can use to destroy him? That's every one of these groups had the same, same thing. 
and they sent their disciples to him along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. In other words, let me stroke you and tell you how great you are for saying these things. Now say some of them so we can use them to hang you with. Right? That's exactly what they were after here. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus was aware of their malice and said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? And he said, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So, he didn't win, did he? They just had to turn their backs and leave because all these smart people, the Pharisees and Herodians had sent, they couldn't outsmart him because what he said did not fit their needs. What they, it is, <clears throat> is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Well, they had a reason for asking him that question. If Jesus said yes, then the Pharisees could condemn him to the people for supporting the Romans. If he said no, then the Herodians would report him to the Roman government and condemn him for not being lo loyal to the civil authorities. Now we know why the Pharisees brought the Herodians. Because if they said yes, the Pharisees had him and could take him to the Sanhedrin and try him, right? If he said no, then the Herodians had him. Okay? Jesus' response was, because he knew their hearts, okay? He knew what they were trying to do, so he managed to answer their yes or no question without using yes or no. Okay. So what did he teach them by doing that? Or teach us? Right? One, one of the things he taught us was we have an obligation to uh, fulfill our civil responsibilities. We have an obligation to pay taxes. Okay. We have an obligation to fulfill the law of the whatever government we're under. And that by fulfilling that obligation, in this case it was to Caesar, in our case it was to the IRS, right? That's not inconsistent with a total allegiance to God. We have to fulfill both our duties. So, since that didn't work, here come the Sadducees, right? Matthew 22, 23 through 33. The same day the Sadducees... <clears throat> so, not, anyway, not to be outdone, but they came to ask about resurrection. All right? The same day they came to him <clears throat> and they asked him a question saying, Teacher... Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh. After them all, the, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Okay. But Jesus answered them, You're wrong. 
because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as far as the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There's a lot of meaning in what he just said here. Because it says, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Okay. But you don't catch this unless you look at it really close. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Well, what, what is his teaching here? Well, remember he, when he was talking to Moses and he says, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. How can he be their God if they no longer exist? So the point here is that if he is the God of those three, then those three are still living. So there is obviously an afterlife. They did not just die and turn to nothing but dust. Their spirit lives on. Okay? And there are none of these Sadducees that argue that verse in the Bible. Remember, they believe in everything from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Well, guess who's in there? Moses. Right? And they believe that God told Moses that he is the God of those three, those living three. He's not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. So once again, there goes the Sadducees. So even though they assumed that the resurrection existed, it would be what they assumed was that if the resurrection existed, it would be impossible to straighten this out. That Jesus' response, he said they did not know the scriptures. All right. <clears throat> he said they did not know the scriptures of power in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, but also he says concerning the relationship, there were several things to consider. One is Death dissolves the marriage bond. Also, we will have spiritual bodies, not physical bodies. Okay. Physical appetites will be left behind. This does not mean that we will not have a connection with our loved ones, but our relationship will be different. We will have a spiritual relationship. Not a physical one. Concerning the spiritual world, in uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-two was a quotation from Exodus three six. Okay, remember that's one of the books the Sadducees believed in. God said, "I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob." Okay, and that's why he used that argument. And once again, he shut them down. If the Sadducees premise that dead man vanished, vanished to nothing were correct, then God was basically saying in that verse, I am the God of nothing. If he said, I am the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, if they did not live, then he would be the God of nothing. Well, even the Sadducees knew that he was not the God of nothing. See? Let me see. Okay. 
Okay. So far, what have we learned from these interactions? Notice how Jesus answered these questions and what we can learn from his answers. It's important that uh, we explain why we do things. Okay? So when we when we look at what Christ is doing, it's important that we explain why we do things as in the case of the Pharisees. It's important that we use the scriptures to explain answers. As Christ did. He used that little part of Exodus to explain why God was the God of a living, why there must be an afterlife. It's important that even when we're surrounded by our enemies, we stay focused on the situation and glorifying God. That needs to be our focus, not getting it over on our fellow men, but glorifying God. It's important not to forget the people around you. The one challenging you is not the only one who matters. Jesus was not finished. The Pharisees then came back and asked another question. Jesus was on, on his way to the cross, but he was still trying to teach people. Can you imagine knowing that you had all that coming up, but yet you loved the people so much that you still continued teaching from that love? So maybe, maybe that's what we need. Maybe if we thought of ourselves as being on the way to the cross... We could be motiva more motivated to learn and more motivated to teach others. If we thought of ourselves as having to be ready to meet Jesus, perhaps we could do a better job. I forgot to click that one, so... Let me make sure I covered all those. Yeah, we got it. Okay. And Jesus was never finished. He wasn't finished on this day. He wasn't finished with everything they threw at him. He did not finish until when? Till he said, it is finished. Right? He was there and teaching and loving us until he said it was finished. What's, what's that? It ain't over till I say it's over. There's some movie or something another has that over in it. But that's the way it was. That's when he was finished. So when we look, look back at all the things he went through coming to this day and this time, all the, all the people that were stacked up against him, yeah. he had to put up with the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrins and the Herodians and the Romans. He had to put up with his own family that didn't believe in him. His own town, his own village. But he loved us so much that putting that word out and warning them and praying for them and weeping over them were his priorities in life. Just as our priorities in life should be praying for those around us, loving those around us, Okay, and working to save those around us. That's the messages he's putting out here. He's, he's putting the message out and teaching all these different sects humility. Be humble and love your God. Work always to show your love for God. So I guess when we look in our hearts, well, maybe we do need to keep in mind that we need to be making that trip to the cross. We need to be going there.
to worship Him, to show our love and our sacrifice and be willing to give all for God. We need to ask ourselves every day when we get up and we say that first prayer, are we doing all that we can for God? Are we doing all that we can for God by loving those around us, by spreading His love to those around us? Are we doing that or are we just concentrating on our own lives? Our own things. Our money. Yeah. Are we doing everything? Are you doing everything you can to show God that you love Him? Have you, have you made that commitment to God? Have you heard what God's got to say? Have you believed it? Yeah. Have you repented of your sins? You know, you don't you don't just repent of your sins in preparation for baptism. You should repent of your sins in preparation for the day. You should repent of your sins in preparation to go to sleep at night. You should repent of your sins prior to taking the Lord's Supper. Because you didn't stop sinning when you were baptized. If you did, you're like a miracle baby, huh? Because the rest of us didn't. I've never been able to quit. But I, I'm sorry for it. And I try to investigate it when I catch it. So that I can change it. That's what we need to do. Because we'll never be completely... Clear And God knew that and that's what it was all about. That's why he enabled us to repent of our sins rather than sacrifice an animal which never really got rid of them. So, once you, once you repent of those sins, are you confessing daily to someone about your love for Jesus? Not just to yourself, but confessing means to spread that word to others that you love Jesus. Confessing means sounding off. I'm a Christian. I love God. Won't you come with me and love him too? Let me share that with you. Are you helping others to come to baptism? Or if you're not baptized, have you thought maybe it's time? Then once we do all that, we know the baptismal is always ready. Brother Ewell keeps that thing filled with water all the time. Notice I didn't say warm water. It's not always warm. But it's ready for you. God's ready for you. God's also ready if you feel like you need to come forward and repent. And get the prayers of the church. Now's a good time to do that. You've seen what he's gone through. What he went through in the temple. Surrounded by enemies. Trying to destroy him. Trying to belittle his work. Trying, trying to make him stand out as something evil. Right? You saw what he went through for you. Won't you go through some things for him? If you're ready, you can come as we stand and sing.